Uh, Your Royal Highness, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, thank you enough for the Farming Scholarship Trust, Dartington Cattle Breeders, the Trahane Trust. A special thanks to my wife, Nikki, who persuaded me to do the um, Nuffield Scholarship in the first place. She was quite pleased to get rid of me for eight weeks <laughs> after 20 years of marriage. Um, yeah, in 2012, when I chose my subject, uh, the milk price was 26. It got up to 20, 33, and then we were all pinching ourselves, thinking, the crisis is too good to be true, and it certainly was. So it's back down to 26 again now. And I had a friend of mine in, the, in my kitchen, and he said to me, I said to him, 25, 26, 33, and he goes, well, you want to wake up and smell the coffee, you dairy farmers? And you can always guarantee on a friend to give you some good advice, and I thought that was quite good advice. So what can we do to take our industry forward in, in what is going to be an increasingly volatile market? We have to reduce co costs to stay competitive. It's not something that's easy, but it is something that's in our control. Now, I chose to travel to China, Australia, and New Zealand. This is me, dressed up like a ready-to-go round a medical, medical factory. This is a, a local businessman who took me out to China. I spent three days with him, and in the middle it was um, his secretary in China, and she also was my interpre interpreter for, all, for, the, for the week. So I went to China, uh, everything you, you see as growing up was made in China, so I thought it was a good place to start, to, to study the manufacturing industry in China and to see if we could learn anything. As dairy farmers, we produce milk, and I see it no different than making a plastic toy or anything else that the Chinese make. It. So it was a good place to start and, and, and just study what they're doing. We had a lot of meetings. Um, uh, we went to a lot of different sort of factories. This was a medical factory, and when we were having our meetings, they were talking about qu um, quantity that you wanted to order and the price. And, and I said to, to, to Gordon, I said, well, what about the quality? He said, the quality is a given. Wherever you go, it's a given. I'm, it was just medical equipment, so you couldn't afford to have a little glip to it with, with, with the, um, whatever you're making. And I'm sure that was, quite, that was often the case with what we do in with our, with our farming industry. Quality is usually very high. And when you're producing a mass product like milk, the only thing you can do in your control is um, to reduce farm costs. So what did they learn? Or what did they observe? They had relentless competition. This drove, drove their efficiency. They had a very skilled workforce. They worked hard, they worked very hard to get ahead. Education was usually the driver behind it, educate, to try and get ahead to educate their children, which made me feel very lucky, because our children in this country have got a, um, a ready-made um, education. They really had to work hard for it. So that was a key driver. So as much as, much as anything, I, I thought it was much easier to be a dairy farmer in England than it was to, to manufacture goods in, China, and the Chinese would give, a, give their right arm for the, for the, for the business opportunities uh, a British dairy farmer would have. This next picture um, sums up my nuffled in a way, because you never know, quite know where you're going to end up. I had a, a, a farm, farm visit cancelled, and I ended up, the, 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 the interpreter said, I get you in countryside, because I was in Shanghai for a week, I get you in countryside, she said, go to bus stop. And I ended up with the, 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 the Shanghai, or the equivalent of Shang, a Shanghai WI. And we had a, <laughs> we had a great day out with, um, I'd never, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't understand a word they said. <laughs> they didn't understand me. Even after interpretation, I didn't know what I was eating. <laughs> but it was a brilliant day out, and that's the, just a very short example of the things that Nuffield, where, where Nuffield can take you. Um, from there I flew on to Australia. I met a lot of Australian farmers at, the, at our, our opening conference. And I was inspired by them in, in their, in their div diverse nature of their agricultural businesses. I went to 12 farms in, in Victoria, and it was much the same as England really. Their, their, their industry was similar, they were fragmented. 
they had struggled more than we have with um, volatility for years. They've got no subsidies, they've got poor trade tariffs compared with New Zealand. And it was certainly survival of the fittest. It was nothing you could have gone on farming and you're looking along, oh, he's gone bust, and he's gone bust and started. It's not, it's, um, it, was, it was a real eye-opener for me to, 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 to do business in that climate. It was a, it was a real learning curve. Um, I also visited the milk factory. We had an interesting day with, the, with the, the CEO that manages the milk factory. It produced a billion litres cheese and butter, and they were working on um, value-added products. The, the, the CEO that took me around was, was, was a really typical Aussie, so proud of what he was doing. I visited the, um, a biological farming company. This company um, made uh, compost and then sold it to local businesses, businesses to improve their soil. <coughs> Something that's really biological farming sounds technical. It's just a common sense way to improve your soil. So it's something that really impressed me. And like grassland farming, you don't it doesn't get the get get the press it deserves because it only benefits the farmer. So it's a, just another example of doing your own research and see what you can bring back to your own business. Because too many farmers, dairy farmers particularly in England, take advice from a sales rep, which is certainly bad business. From there. I met this chap. I met Peter Kaylock on the CFC, and we were roughly. He was a, he was the oldest of, of their scholars. I was one of the oldest in our group. We had children the same age. We talked about farming and family, and, and we spent quite a bit of time together. And during our conversation, he had a, he said I said he, he explained his farming business, and he had a ten-year drought. And I thought, well, Christ, if he's got a ten-year drought, he's got to be a damn good farmer. So I thought, I'd better go and see him. And coming from Dorset, where it rains, I've lived in Dorset for 47 years, it rains every month without fail. So a 10-year drought was, was, was certainly something that drew me to him. I stayed with him and he explained how he grew his business to 7,000 hectares, growing irrigated rice, wheat, rape. He had some stone fruit. His family had been on the farm for 100 years, so he, he, he also dealt with every 25 years, he had a mice plague locusts, and even in a good year, flooding. So the, the, le the, the, um, the lessons learned there were the extreme volatility. So we, as dairy farmers, we call it volatility, but you can learn something by looking at other people who, who farm in, in much difficult circumstances than we do. He had to weigh the risk and returns up. He, he had a harvest two years and five or three years and five and he had to weigh the risk and returns up and as dairy farmers we're going to have to start to do that. From then on the, the highlight of my trip was and, and was a trip to New Zealand and I asked my wife to write out a cheque for 4,500 euros and wire it to a chap in, New, in, in, to, to wire it to a chap in Ireland. She said where are you going? I said I'm going to go for three weeks to, three weeks to, um, to New Zealand with some Irish farmers. And she said, is that going to cost you 4,500 euros? And, and she obviously, it didn't, it didn't have um, business written on it when you're going to travel for three weeks with 25 Irish farmers. But that couldn't have been farther from the truth. We visited 28 farms in, in 22 days. We drove past Lake Tahoe, and the bus driver says, on your right you have Lake Tahoe. Ten minutes later, we were on another farm looking at another set of accounts. So we had no time for any, any distractions, and I certainly got what I paid for. We were very, very fortunate to study the best operators. They were in the top 1% of what they did. They weren't typical, but they are the sort of businesses that you need to study if you want to improve your own. One business was milking 55,000 cows on 100 farms with a value of nearly 1 billion New Zealand dollars. I often had, I thought before, well, everyone, everyone seems to be going to New Zealand and Australia. And why is this? It's not because the beaches are nice and we speak the same language. It's because they are the best operators in the world, without a joke. They've got no subsidies. There's no smoke and mirrors when you're analysing those businesses. They are what they are. And it, and it, was, a, it, was, it was a real great 
great, um, um, great experience going to those countries. And on, on um, the, the, the businessman said to me, or said to us as we were stood next to me, he said, excuses are like arsos. Everyone's got one and they usually stink. <laughs> so, as a dairy industry, we need to, um, we're running out of excuses if we don't get our acting gear. So what did I find? Like I said, I was lucky to study the best farmers, so what were the common traits? They were first and second generation businesses. Not necessarily first and second generation farmers, but first and second generation businesses. They're always planning and budgeting. They're good business models. In dairy farming, if you've got the wrong business model, you can soon flog a dead horse. So you've got to get that business, business model right. They were very optimistic. They had a determined attitude. They did not succumb to marketing hype. The questions they asked themselves was, do I really need this? Will this make money? Am I getting the best out of my staff? Could I do this better? Could I do this more efficiently? What do I, do need, what do I, do I need to do to help me achieve these goals? Get the right person around you. When you ring up the vet practice and it's a routine, this routine um, call, make sure you ask for the best vet. They might have 10. You get the best one because you deserve it because you're playing vet's rates. Um, get the best consultant you can get your hands on. It's far better to have a, cons a good consultant twice a year than it is um, an average one once a month. So these people were very good at getting the right people around them. Governance was, was a key issue we talked to as your business grows. My business at home will be a very good profitable business, but it certainly lacked governance. So the main the main be benefit of good governance is frees up time for management, and, and time for management enables you to low lower your costs. So, to sum up, we are brilliant stockmen, we can grow crops, we have good climate, we have 70 million consumers on our doorstep. And this means nothing unless you've got the right business model in place. Be much more businesslike and employ good governance to make a, take advantages of these things that we enjoy. My effort has inspired me, it's inspired my friends, it's inspired my family, but most of all, it's inspired my children. Thank you very much. <laughs>